Uh oh. Uh oh. What did we draw? We got a bug for our ten legs. All right, here we go. We are up on YouTube. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Here we go. I'm back now, and I can put myself here. Here we go. All right, hello, everybody. Hassan to Karen, my husband Moshe, our son Hashi, can you say hi? Yeah. yeah. And today we're going to talk about Passover because Purim's over, it's in the past now, and we move forward to our next big holiday, which is Passover. Are you excited for Passover? Are you excited for matzah? Mm, I'm excited for matzah. So one of the things, Hashi, I gotta talk about the Seder, please. Okay. Daddy's gonna take Hashi for a little bit. All right. So, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, I've had a lot of years of experience as a waitress working in catering. And uh, one of the things that I find very important to me is setting my table. Usually, what I would have is some sort of tablecloth. I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. Um, the past few years, I've been doing a parting of the Red Sea themed tablecloth where I have blue and tan tablecloths and I have little people like my little Moses over here on the tan part of the tablecloth walking through the water as if they are leaving Egypt. Part of decorating your table is setting the atmosphere of whatever you want the night to be like. So when we have kids around the table, it's very important to be very freilich, to have little gimmicks, and to have fun little toys to keep them entertained and occupied while the adults are doing our more serious Seder work. But first, we have to have a nice little table setting. So if you'll notice here, if you can see, although I'm using glass, so it might be difficult. So I'm going to bring the camera a little bit closer each time. What you want to do is you want to set your table with your silverware out that you're going to need for the whole meal. It's very important so that you're not going back and forth into the kitchen as the host to constantly be getting, oh, a salad fork. Oh, now I need a dinner fork. Okay, let's collect the steak knife or whatever silverware you happen to be using. So... We have out our soup spoon and our knife on the right hand side. The knife is always on the inside with the blade facing the plate so that if you put your arm down, you don't cut yourself on the blade of the knife. And then on the left side is where you have your napkin, the salad fork or your smaller fork or gefilte fish fork in this case. It's going to be on the outside with your dinner fork on the inside. And then on the top, you can have your teaspoon for anybody who likes to have hot tea during their meal or coffee for them to be able to stir it with. Again, you want your big wine glass. I mean, or you can have a small wine glass, but it's always nice to have the big wine glasses for your delicious grape juice or wine, whatever your preference may be. So my table is set with my plate, my bowl, and my little tiny plate on top for my gefilte fish. The reason for layering your plates also is for clearing purposes. Um, after you're done with your first course, you can just take the top plate off, and then you have whatever next course plate is underneath it. Again, this helps with hosting. If you're hosting a lot of people, sometimes the in-between the courses after you're done serving your meal could be a little bit time-consuming. So if you can think ahead and plan that part out, then that could be really helpful when uh, when having a large dinner party in general, not just for Passover. But this is a very special dinner party, and the dinner part is not even the big part of the party, right? The part is everything that leads up to the dinner. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to incorporate one of my courses as part of our Seder. So if you'll notice in your Haggadah, there's a part that's called Karpas which is about fresh spring vegetables. And it doesn't have to be just the parsley or the leaves, right? The chazeret, the lettuce that we have on our Seder plate. 
Although we do dip the parsley twice into our salt water. Remember to always have water and a lot of salt. We don't want a little bit of salt. We want it to be the saltiest water, right? And so we're going to put salt in. I happen to have a grinder here. It makes it a little bit easier. If you don't, get a really fine salt. Kosher salt is wonderful for chicken soup, but for salt water on your Pesach table, it doesn't dissolve quick enough into the water for you to be able to taste that salty water on your parsley. So as I was saying, during that karpas part of our Seder, you can serve salads, you can serve vegetables, you can serve a crudite platter of cauliflower, broccoli, carrots. These are all vegetables that come from the ground. We're talking about ha'adama. We're talking about vegetables that grow from the earth. Any kind of vegetable will work in this case. It doesn't have to be just those leafy kind of vegetables. So it's a great opportunity also if you plan to have a longer Seder to hold off those people who maybe are getting a little antsy and are waiting for dinner feed them a little bit, and then they'll last a little bit longer in your Seder. My Seder plate was bought for my mom and my dad many years ago, and when they sold their house, we got the beautiful Seder plate to adorn our table. It's really nice to be able to pass down these kinds of ritual items from one generation to the next, because then when your child is the one hosting, and you go and sit at their table, you get to be reminded of those beautiful things. I still have the Afi Coleman bag that I made in nursery school out of, I think it was like wallpaper and some yarn that I sewed together with some hole punched holes and God bless my mother, she saved it and we use it every year to this day. It's sitting in my attic waiting to be brought down for Passover. Hopefully, maybe Hashi will bring home one this year, and uh, we can hide multiple apicomans. <laughs> so here's my Seder plate, and I want to go through the items in the Seder plate because it's very important to have all of our ritual items. One of the things is this, which probably looks different than when you might have. This is horseradish. It looks like this normally. It's a root. It's a root vegetable. It kind of looks like a parsnip. Um, does she want the parsnip? No. It's a horseradish. I cut the horseradish into pieces. Here, you can hold it. Yeah, you can hold it. It also comes in a jar, already ground up, sometimes with beet juice, which makes it a little bit sweeter. Uh, but the idea is that you're supposed to taste the horseradish and that bitterness that comes with it. It's called maror, which means bitterness. And so if you don't have horseradish, you could use another bitter vegetable or herb. You can use um, romaine lettuce, which also is bitter. So if you can't find horseradish, today Stop and Shop had no gold horseradish. I'm going to have to talk to someone about that. Uh, but we had some horseradish root, so we went back to the basics for that one. I don't know if I recommend eating this straight. It's a little bit rough if you've never tried it. Have you ever had it? Oh, it's a, little, a lot rough. <laughs> it's a lot rough. <laughs> and if you uh, are very strong of smell, you can try and grind it yourself on like a cheese grinder or on a garlic grinder, a garlic plane. But again, it's going to be very sharp on your nose. Has anybody here done that before by a show of hands? Yeah, Carol. Carol grinds her own horse every year, right? You grow it in your garden. Awesome, awesome. So next time I'm going to come to you for some horseradish to grind up. You got it. All right, next on our Seder plate is our besa, which is our egg. Usually it's roasted. If you don't have a roasted egg, you can take uh, so any flame and hold the egg over the flame. And the blackness from the flame will discolor your egg and it will look as if it is a roasted egg. What you can do is you can also hard boil it, which I suggest if you're not gonna roast it. This way at least it's sitting on the table, it's cooked and you don't have a raw egg sitting on your Seder table for however many hours you're sitting at your Seder table for. 
The next typical thing on our Seder plate is our haroset. So I made a little haroset for us for today. My haroset has walnuts, apples, cinnamon, and grape juice. You can use wine. You can use any other kind of nut. You don't have to put in the nuts. You can use any kind of apples that you want. The idea is that it looks like the mortar, right? That we put the bricks together to create the pyramids. And so, I don't know if this looks like mortar to you, but it's mighty delicious. And uh, it's something that I recommend having an extra bowl of, if you'll notice. I have a nice big bowl that you can then put at the other side of the table. If your family is anything like my family, some people take big scoopfuls of the haroset onto their plates. And it's yummy, delicious. Hashi, do you like apples? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Hashi will have some haroset this year. So we already talked about the karpas, which is those spring vegetables. You can either use parsley. You can use the tops of a celery stalk. That also works really nicely. And again, any kind of salad, you want to make a diced Israeli salad, that sounds delicious too. And might fill your bellies a little bit while you're continuing your Seder. There's two items on my Seder plate that are new and different and you may not know about. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of why it's on our Seder plate, and then you can decide for yourself if you wish to add it this year. One is an orange. An orange was added to Seder plates in a few years past to welcome the inclusiveness of LGBTQ Jews in the world and to know that not everybody fits. And so we want to make sure that it's whole, round, so that everybody fits in. Right? We're all made on this beautiful earth together. This citrus fruit is a fruit of life. It grows on trees, right? The tree of life. And so here we are all together celebrating, being as inclusive as we can be to everybody. So here's my orange for my Santa plate. And then the last thing that I have are olives. Has anybody ever had olives on their Seder plates before? So olives represent the knowledge of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians currently in the Middle East and a reminder to us that there is not peace on earth everywhere and that we have to continue to pray for peace on earth. And so we have olives to represent that Middle Eastern spice on our table. Would you like an olive? Wonderful. I'm going to move the camera a little bit over here. There we go. The next thing on my table, you'll see a big box behind me, is matzah. You can't have Seder without matzah. Is that right? Matzah. That's right. So I have two things of matzah here. First, I have my mother's matzah cover which has three separate slots in it, three separate little spaces for the three matzahs that we use as part of the Seder. Which matzah do we break in half? Hashi, which matzah do we break in half? The middle matzah. That's right, so we take out the middle matzah, we break it in half, and that becomes our afikomen. So we would put it in my nursery school, afikomen little hider. Hopefully, like I said, Hashi will bring us a new one, and we can move on to the next generation of afikomen hiding objects. And the eldest at the table, at least in my family, the eldest at the table is the one to hide the Afi Coleman, at some point when the kids are not watching, whether that's a distraction or whether you do it sometime during the meal when the kids are eating, you find a time when they're not watching so that you're not being obvious about it. And then at some point later, the kids go off during Safun to find our Afi Coleman. Another fun game for those kids to play. 
One thing I want to talk about, which is my favorite, are those 10 plagues. They're not my favorite because they're the 10 plagues. But they're my favorite because it's the most engaging part of the story for the kids. And for some adults who are kids at heart. And so what we've done at our table, as you can see what Hashi has. Hashi, you want to put on the sunglasses? Why do we have sunglasses? It takes away the light. And so we have sunglasses on the table for our darkness plague. We have a wig on. Dad, you want to put that wig on for me? That's why I have my assistants. Hashi, Hashi wants to do it. One second. Let's, let's get Hashi to do it. Hashi, One of the, is Hashi's? Mine, Yeah, you're going to put on that mask? You put on a wig? All right. So one of the things no, about no. the wig, Daddy, just put the wig on for me, please. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. The last plague is the death of the firstborn. And so one of the things that the Jews did, I love it, is they put blood on their doorposts to separate themselves and to let the angel that was passing by know that they were Jewish homes and they could be saved from this last plague. And so at my family's table, at least last year, we all put on these wigs so that we could differentiate ourselves, that we were the Jews and that they could pass over our um selves and they could save us from that 10th plague also so if i ever go into the witness protection program this is my disguise so <laughs> absolutely what else do we have in that bowl of 10 plagues there we have the masks that's right you can buy some really fun things on amazon yeah. at a judaica store these are a pack of 10 plagues they're masks and you can pass them around and different people can wear the different masks and they can represent the different plagues that happen during the story. These are all just different ways of keeping everybody engaged in what's going on. And then the last thing, which I think is one of the most important parts, is picking your Haggadah. Which Haggadah you use is very important. This is just only some of them. I have a whole bookcase filled with Haggadah. Sometimes we want something simple. This is the Haggadah that I grew up on. This is the one that I colored in and we knew word for word and every song in the book. And it's great to give a child some crayons and their own Haggadah and let them be a part of the story. Let them be a part of it. If you have no kids at your table, which is fine, then you don't need that. Unless you want crayons and coloring books, that's fine too. I have to say that some of the supermarkets put out their own Haggadot. And they're very user-friendly in the sense that if you don't like one of the pages, you can skip it. And you don't have to read word for word what's in it. This particular one I picked up in Florida at a supermarket called Publix. Has anyone been to a Publix in Florida before? <laughs> this one has really nice illustrations in it and has English and Hebrew as well and is very easy to follow along. These, again, are not very expensive and they're very user-friendly and wonderful. This one's from Publix. I think this one that everybody knows is the Maxwell House. Haggadah. Some of them are blue, like this one. This is a newer edition of the Maxwell House Haggadah. Some of them are like a yellowy orange and a red kind of color. Again, these are very um, full of talking points, of songs, has the entire text in it too. So somebody who wants a fuller Seder and wants to be able to do everything, this is the way that you would go. And then there's something in the middle, which is what we've found works for our family. This is called the Joyous Haggadah. This is the one that my family currently uses, our family. It has a little bit of a mix. It has really nice illustrations, which I think is important for everyone. But it also has all of the songs in it as well. And it has historical information 
and maps to show where the Jews were going during this whole story. What is happening during the Seder? And one part that I think is very important that sometimes people leave out are the songs at the end. Don't forget to come back to your table to sing Echad Mi Odea and Echad Gadia and to have some fun when your bellies are finally full of all that food that you've been eating. It's also uh, a great, great idea if you have a number of people at your stay there to take one person to take each character and to make the noise. So you get to really uh, become the character sort of like, uh, you know, a little bit of ad lib uh, Seder. And it's really fun. It's really joyful. And it's a good way of ending the Seder, um, not just through music, but through joy. Absolutely. Through a little storytelling, too. Absolutely. What we did last year is after we were done with our meal and we were going to come back and finish the rest of the Seder, we sat in the living room on the couches all comfortable, right? Where normally people would go congregate after they're done eating. We sang our songs sitting around on the couches. I was a dog and someone was a cat and another one was a goat and my dad was throwing shekels around and, you know, we had a good time with Kat Gadya. Is that your daddy? Yeah, it's his daddy. That's very nice. And maybe this year his daddy will be the one throwing the shekels around. <laughs> Um, and then we come back for dessert afterwards. You know, there's there's something to finishing the Seder. And I think that there's some families who maybe miss out on that second part. And it's very important because we're trying to find a way of connecting with our ancestors, connecting with Jews around the world, and really feeling the sense of accomplishment that we have done our due diligence in celebrating the story of Passover and in teaching it to our children, because that's what we're told, right? To tell it over and over and over again in a way that people can understand it, in a way that is engaging and appropriate to where they are in their lives and in their journeys, either as Jews, as people, as children or adults, and to meet them where they are to have those meaningful discussions and to talk and to share. Yeah, you definitely want to uh, keep in mind who's at your table. It's not gonna, if you have one size fits all at your, at your pa Passover table, you're invariably gonna have a situation where it's not gonna fit the, the table that, that, you know, that, that that's in front of you, one second. And so like when we have, one second, let me finish, okay? And so, when we have, when we have, uh, when we had all adults, you know, five years ago, our table looked very different than the, now. We have a lot of kids, and we have to kind of include them and get them into it, and and how that looks and how that feels is 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 it's a richer uh, contextual seder because we have to stretch ourselves. So the seder is very much about growth, even within your own family and your own seder table, and and how that looks for for your seder is. We have to be willing to kind of bend, and that's really, uh, it's not the same old Seder every time. So maybe that's another reason to look at different Haggadot uh, to kind of guide the Seder. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you, and I want to show you some of the things that we did two years ago, not two years ago, pre-pandemic. My years are, are gone now. It's either pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, right? So uh, a Seder table uh, pre-pandemic and then our Seder table last year, which was filled with children. And you can see the difference even in just the way that I set up the table in general. So, okay, so here we are. Here's my, uh, this was our Seder table pre-pandemic that was mostly filled with adults, okay? We had a beautiful flowers in the middle of the table. There were Haggadot. We had our wine glasses, but it was a very simple setting, okay? Now, last year we had all children, and so the table looked a little different. We had our wigs. We had multiple Seder plates, including this one that my nephew, William, made in nursery school. 
There's another Seder plate that was made in a religious school setting. You can see actually on top how we have um, all of my niece's little dolls in the center crossing the Red Sea. Here's one set of water and here's another set of water. And our little red stones represent the blood. Glasses are our darkness, our choshech. And we have frogs everywhere. Frogs here, frogs there, frogs are everywhere. I have little cows eating the karpas and the chazeret off of the Seder plate. Here is our Seder with our crossing of the Red Sea with our two beautiful tablecloths representing the water. And you'll notice every plate has a wig on it. Again, we have frogs everywhere jumping on wine glasses, on the table, all over the place. And one of the things that we did was we played around with 10 plagues. So if anybody has seen, there's a, a game called What's Up or Heads Up, and you have to guess what the card is on your head. So we all picked a random card and we put them on our heads and everyone had to guess by asking questions, what plague is on my head? Is that mommy? Yeah, mommy was had the blood plague, but I'm wearing the choshech sunglasses and the makat bechorot wig. Here's my uh, brother-in-law and my nephew also Daddy. wearing theirs, and it was fun. It was freilich. And here is my niece and my sister and my father again, all playing along, and they're all trying to figure out who's wearing which ten plague. Here's my husband. And here we are. We got a nice group shot of everybody with their wigs on. And keep in mind, we also, last year, because it was COVID, we had this, we had 20 other people joining us. And we sent them each uh, all these accoutrements so they could enjoy with the wigs and the glasses and all this stuff. We sent them a little package. I don't know if anybody went that far, but, and, um, and, and food was not included, so batteries were not included. <laughs> but um, but the truth is, is that everybody had such a fun time. They said it was the best Seder they had in a long time, um, even before COVID, because they they were they really enjoyed it. So I think um, I, I can only imagine if they were live and they were able to do it like that. And this, this is our first time also for us stretching ourselves out uh, to make it for children, because we had realized that we hadn't changed the... the the Seder for children, and, and we had we had children in previous, and, and that, this wasn't our first year to have children, and it became stale. The children weren't, weren't part of it, so then the parents couldn't be part of it because if the children are running around, then the parents have to be running around. So Mom, we really, Mom. if you engage the children, you engage everybody else. That's really the truth. Mom. Um, Mom. Yeah. Mom. yeah. Absolutely. So I want to open up the floor a little bit and ask you some questions and share a little bit. Um, my first question really is, is there anything special that you have at your Seder table that makes it unique, that really, you know, makes it your Seder? It wouldn't be, for example, my Seder if I didn't have all these, like, gimmicky little things for the kids and little tchotchkes all over and a fun table setting and Heshi laughing in the corner, right? So if anyone wants to share anything, I would love to hear from you. You can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. I have a weird thing. I don't know if it's weird. My, my son's in-laws are Catholic. His wife converted, but of course his in-laws did not. So every time we have them at a Seder, I have the sections of the New Testament that show that the Last Supper was a Seder. And they read those parts and I show them how that's, you know, going on on our Seder table. And it becomes a very beautiful, inclusive thing instead of, um, you know, it could be weird, but it's very nice. 
I love that. I think that's great. You know, one of the things that we're told to do for Passover is to invite people to our table who maybe have never been to a Passover table, who have never sat through a Seder, who don't know the story. And so it's our job to teach the story. So absolutely, Lisa, 100%. That's wonderful. Would anybody else like to share? Um, I'd like to say something. I'm home now. I've been doing the first data, I'd say, since maybe 1995. So um, I still have the old place cards that my daughters did back then, you know? So that's another wow. thing. Wow. And, and unfortunately, some of those people are no longer living with us. And, my, and now my daughters are in their late 20s and 30s. And also, um, we always have Miriam's Cup. And another song we do, Who Knows One? We go around at fun. the table doing that, you know? And just Barbara, does everyone have their own part? Yes, each one. We all, and sometimes, it, you know, we have to take more than one part. And also, uh, I remember when you first came, um, you had these uh, upstairs in the boardroom, you did something. And I started, I don't know if it was you or Rabbi Warmflash, I also started to have, um, I cut up celery and other vegetables at the beginning of the meal. You know, I've been doing that for years also. There's no problem in feeding your guests while you're having your Seder. There is nothing. We, lo we love to eat. We are Jewish people. We like to feed people and we like to eat. So there's no point in not feeding or eating <laughs> during our Seder. I also have all the silverware is already out on the table, the glasses. And I also have a little plate in front of everyone for them to put their matzah and you know, the parsley, et cetera. Perfect. You know, so, awesome. So, Thank you you know, I've been doing this also for many years. <laughs> Awesome. Yes, Lori. Yeah, hi. Well, we also, we sing Miriam's song and we pull out every instrument we have in the house. That's awesome. Tambourines and maracas and those frogs that you go back and forth. Oh, yeah. Perfect, because they're frogs. And we dance around the table. But, we, you know, we also do Miriam's cup. And um, I don't know if, if you mentioned Elijah's cup, too. Um, and we have uh, supplemental song sheets that we give out because there were just some songs like the one to the tune of Clementine that's not in, in there. Um, so that's what, you know, that we do. It's, it's lots of fun. And we also, we go around, we pass a bag around and everybody pulls out the plague and hides it until it's their turn. So we do that. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have to do that. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I think that these are all great things that you do at your families. I love the idea of dancing. I'm a big fan of music, obviously. Um, a few years ago, before we actually bought these Haggadot that we currently use, we did mostly song parodies for Passover. And I know I've done a few classes with uh, those of you at Herjik to write your own song parodies. And I've given out my compilation of song parodies. And you can find them online. You can really source your own, but it's nice to bring in something new, like um, sweet kosher wine instead of sweet Caroline, right? There's lots of really fun um, songs like that that you can add. And it helps for those people who may not know the traditional songs to still feel included and feel a part of it, right? Everyone knows the Beatles, right? So as long as you know this melody and the words are in front of you, it's much easier to sing along than Chat Gadya, which may be a little bit more difficult, for example. Yes. Carol, I want to call upon you for a moment, and I want you to tell us a little bit about your garden and your horseradish and the history of how it came to you planting your own horseradish. Um, well, I remember my father always cutting off the tops of the horseradish and putting it in water. And within a few weeks, it would have roots. And we'd put it in the back. We always had a victory garden since World War II. And we would grow our own vegetables. And um, all of a sudden, we had horseradish. But you have to be careful with growing horseradish because it could take over your uh, garden. And um, because it grows, it's roots and it grows like weeds. So it takes about two years until you have a root uh, that's big enough to grate. And I have a Passover um, uh, 
not not a mixer. A uh, I, I used to use a um, a blender oh, but, to, to okay. chop it up, but now I use the Cuisinart. And um, you have to be very careful because you don't realize that when the fumes start, you can't see. You have to have everything ready on the table, and the key is to put a a, a little uh, vinegar into the horseradish. Does and, that help with the tears or the nose? It not with that. It helps make it stronger. <laughs> make it no. stronger, Carol. Yes. yes. And what are you trying to do? Always, to there's always a wise guy at the table who says, oh, that's not so strong. Let me smell the jaw. And before you know it, their face is turning bright red and they're gasping for air. So... <laughs> We have a lot of fun with the horseradish, and um, yeah, yeah. Um, how long does I it take? It? We haven't checked the garden yet to see if we have anything. Sometimes it's very slow growing, but we usually get enough. To um, one year, I had so much I brought horseradish into the temple. They thought I picked it up at Gold's. No, I just uh, brought the roots in so that people could have them. And uh, when we had our bonfire at, um, you know, to, throw, to uh, burn the chumets. So if anybody would like to um, just take the top off, cut the top off. And, then and put it in some water. water. When it has roots, stick it in your garden in a place where you don't care if you get a horseradish patch and, uh, and wait and watch. I wonder if we should talk to Dr. Gottlieb about having some horseradish in the mitzvah garden. I spoke to him a couple of years ago, and I, I, he was afraid that it would... Um, <laughs> Is it like bamboo? Corn. It grows everywhere. <laughs> yes, it sends its, its tentacles out, and that you grow more. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think he was too receptive about, uh, oh. about horseradish, unless they find a separate spot and put the horseradish there. Well, thank you, Carol. I'll have to come to you for some really strong horseradish this year. Well, I'll let you know what I have. <laughs> but I have, I have, um, uh, uh, you know, chives already. <laughs> awesome. I'm ready for them. Well, to tell me your experience with horseradish. Well, I, I don't want to, I, I'm not really experienced with horseradish, but I'm going to say that for me, like all things, it comes down to the food. And Passover, yeah, we have to say there, but let's be honest, the food is really the center of all Jewish life. And the question that I have, because I know what food I have over there, and, and, and certainly know what Bonnie has, has, has made in new traditions for, for us. But what traditions do you have that make Passover special with regard to food? What food do you have on Passover, besides matzah, obviously, <laughs> that you're like, that's Passover now? Hmm. I'm going to put it on gallery view so we can see all of it's our It's time. I want to get hungry. Please, go ahead, guys. So one of the things that is a new debate, only the past few years since my husband has joined our table, is jarred versus frozen logged gefilte fish. So I'm going to open the debate because my mom is on, who is team jar, and my husband is here, who is team frozen log. I have to be respectful, but I have to be <laughs> What about your tables? Is there anything where you have that? It has to be, it has to be. I've been no? using the frozen gefilte fish for years already. My uncle mm -hmm. makes it by hand. You know, the, I don't know if his fish are swimming in the bathtub, uh, but he definitely grinds it by hand. My mom's shaking her head now. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, has anyone ever had a fish actually swimming in their bathtub to make gefilte fish? Carol, I knew, I, I thought maybe. <laughs> well, since I'm probably the oldest one here, I grew up with a, a um, carp in the bathtub, and it was a problem because if they didn't make the fish fast enough, nobody could use the, the bath, the uh, shower. So it was a race between getting the gefilte fish made and um, uh, getting your shower. So... I, I couldn't stand it because of the smell, but they, uh, my grandmother used to buy a big carp and it lived a few days in the bathtub until she cut it up. My grandfather was a butcher. 
So he had all the knives and everything to uh, cut it up. So that was um, quite a memory, but we always made our own gefilte fish until um, it got very difficult. And now since frozen, you can't beat that. Unless you really like that, the gel and- um, so, so I have a jar in honor of my mom on our table because mm -hmm. the frozen logs are still in the freezer. So those are not cooked yet, but uh, we, have both. We, we have, will have, we have both, both. We have at both. our table. And sometimes you just have both and that's okay too, right? And sure. so what we do also at our table is we try to find food that fits for everybody. So there are some people who are chicken eaters. There are some people who are meat eaters. There are some people who only eat fish. And then there are also people who are vegetarians. And so you have to know who's sitting at your table and make sure that there's enough options for everyone. And I always say as somebody who was a vegetarian for a little bit, a little bit, side dishes don't always make a meal. So think a little bit ahead of a main dish for somebody who's not eating the chicken or the brisket or uh, whatever else you happen to be serving. Um, another thing you can also make, which... I've made before when on a budget is par of matzo ball soup. Maybe a small thing for people who aren't uh, who aren't eating the chicken. You know, I, I will say that I miss I'm going to miss this year because unfortunately uh, my mother in law is staying in Florida. We forgive her. Um, the the liver. The chopped liver. The chopped my, liver. My aunt Barbara is going to make the chopped I know, liver. I know it's, it's not the same. I know it's not the same. <laughs> It's not the same. And I'm going to have to get the vegetable derma, you know, recipe. There are some things that it's just not the same without. And so those are the types of things that I'm hoping that this uh, series is going to share with all of you as we continue through the weeks. All of our guest chefs who are going to be on, one of which is on tonight. Hi, Cheryl. She's coming up in a little bit. And uh, some of the things that they're going to be sharing are those favorite recipes from their childhood, from their now, from their future, forever. This is the dish that's always going to be at my Passover table, or these are the dishes that I would like to be at my Passover table, right? So we're going to have some dinner favorites, some desserts, some breakfast items, and it's going to be a really nice little journey for us through this cooking series. It ends the Wednesday before Passover, so it gives you enough time to have one more day to go shopping if you do choose to recreate any of the recipes that we will be sharing this month. All of the recipes have been emailed out through Constant Contact. If you need the recipes, let me know and I can resend them to you. That's not a problem at all. And all of these videos are going to live on YouTube, so you can always go back and watch it again. If you didn't cook along and then you decide that you wish to cook along, that's always a good thing too. Our final, final episode, the Wednesday before, will be featuring Ethel, Leviskin, and Cheryl Karp. And they're going to be sharing some of their dessert favorites. And as well, I'm going to be cooking a uh, Lakshin Kugel uh, that is kosher le Pesach and very, 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 very sweet and delicious. And you can decide whether you serve it for dessert or you serve it as your main course. That's from my sister. And it's actually um, an original from my mom. And it's a, it wouldn't, and we only have it once a year for Passover. It's a Passover election kogo, and it is unbelievably delicious. Yeah. Really, really good. And it wouldn't be Passover. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank my husband. I want to thank Heshi. Heshi, can you say bye bye to everyone? Bye. Put a little burp in there too. All right, fair enough. One more bye bye. With a big wave. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for spending time at the Zakarin Seder table. And join us on Wednesday at 1130 for our next Zoom cooking class. And again, if you miss it, it's always here on YouTube. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.